All right, hello everybody. This is AW Antonio Wolf here with uh, my friends Hyperion and Joshua. We are on chapter nine of Franz Kafka's The Trial. For those of you who randomly stumbled on this and for whatever reason are starting here, uh, here's something to uh, tantalize you to listen to the rest. Joseph K is guilty. If you want to know why, well, listen to. Uh, the entire commentary <laughs> series. Uh, all right, chapter nine. This is a big chapter. It's a famous chapter. Well, famous. It's famous only among people who have actually read the book. Anybody who hasn't actually read the book and has only heard of it has never even heard of this. Uh, by the way. Yes. Is in, in the cultural zeitgeist, in other words. Yeah. By the way, uh, you likely have never heard of Todd McGowan, and you probably never would have had I not told you about him. But now I've told you about him. Uh, he put out a... Probably the only... Quite frankly, so far as I've looked on YouTube, the only... Even, like, half-decent... Like, literary analysis of this book, which is... Sad. Uh, because Todd McGowan is wrong. Uh, if you listen to him, uh, he's not as bad as a typical, you know, uh, what would you call, undergraduate <laughs> who's putting out videos uh, reviewing <laughs> yeah. books nowadays. Uh, Todd Book McGowan reviewer. is, uh, yeah. yeah, so Todd McGowan is actually a professor in film studies, so you'd think he'd know about how to make good aesthetic critiques. Yeah, he's or, Proclaimed protege of Zizek, Slavo Zizek. But anyways, go listen to what he says, and compare it to what I say. And uh, if in any way you judge that he's more correct than I am, you're wrong. <laughs> well, but also, I wouldn't even say that. I you don't even have to judge that. You can just like judge which is more compelling. And I think it's pretty simple. Which story is more compelling? Yeah, that too. Well, I mean, yeah. It's not just about compelling. I mean, I think uh, objectively, and, and by I think, I mean this is the case. Universally, yeah, necessarily. Yeah. That uh, too. Th that His the account requires <laughs> more stretches. Yeah, and a lot of external reflections that like are not anywhere within the book at all. Uh, whereas uh, my account, which I consider to be, and somebody w would have to do a pretty damn good job to prove to me that I'm projecting here. There's some things which I, I can admit, like, they're not obvious, like the Gnosticism stuff is maybe not that obvious, because most people aren't aware of it. Okay. Uh, the rest of it, however, uh, just in the, it's around in our cultural milieu, if you grew up in the West, you have contact with these concepts. How you could miss them, I don't know. Obviously, these things are in the text, and uh, the account that we have given in so far uh, as we have commented on this has been cohesive on a level that you know uh, nobody else has, uh, and that's that's part of what uh, something being true is, uh, being capable of having uh, uh, explanatory power, and in this case, uh, total explanatory power. Because I don't know of anything that we've encountered that has not been easily determinable as part of the general concept uh, we laid out since the beginning. The general concept being indeed that uh, Joseph K is guilty and what does that imply uh, in order what context. So, uh, it implies that this isn't just some incomprehensible totalitarian system that he's subject to, or to which he is subject. Yep. Uh, anyways, this chapter is going to be a good one. Uh, this is, quite frankly, uh, Kafka giving you probably the most on-the-face key to this text in a way that is fortunately not obvious not but blatant. Yeah, it's not blatant. Uh, 
But unfortunately, there's a little bit in which Kafka kind of tries to throw you for a loop by uh, trying to muddle things by adding in a certain set of, of interpretations within the text itself about the text itself. Uh, you know, one of those things like, oh, if you thought it was about this, maybe it's not. Uh, <laughs> gets a bit uh, too philosophical. But anyways, let's keep going. Let's get on with it. So, chapter 9. A very important Italian business contact of the bank had come to visit the city for the first time and Kay was given the task of showing him some of its cultural sites. At any other time he would have seen this job as an honor, but now, when he was finding it hard even to maintain his current position in the bank, he accepted it only with reluctance. Every hour that he could not be in the office was a cause of concern for him. He was no longer able to make use of his time in the office anything like as well as he had previously. He spent many hours merely pretending to do important work, but that only increased his anxiety about not being in the office. Then he sometimes thought he saw the deputy director, who was, all, who was always watching, come to Kay's office, sit at his desk, look through his papers, receive clients who had almost become old friends of Kay, and lure them away from him, perhaps even... Perhaps he even discovered mistakes, mistakes that seemed to threaten Kay from a thousand directions when he was at work now, and which he could no longer avoid. So now, if he was ever asked to leave the office on business or even needed to make a short business trip, however much an honor it seemed and tasks of this sort happened to have increased substantially recently, there was always the suspicion that they wanted to get him out of his office for a while and check his work, or at least the idea that they thought he was dispensable. It would not have been difficult for him to turn down most of these jobs, but he did not dare to do so because, if his fears had the slightest foundation, turning the jobs down would have been an acknowledgement of them. What? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like slipped me there. What would that be an, uh, an acknowledgement of? See, it would have been difficult for him to turn down most of these jobs, but he did not dare to do so because if his fears had the slightest foundation, turning the jobs down would have been an acknowledgement of them. Like what? It would have been an acknowledgement that he knew that they knew that he wasn't really up to the jobs uh, normally, so that, you know they were kidding him out. Yeah, I guess so. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, that seems to be the only thing that makes sense here. Uh, which is a real... It's not dumb. Given Kay's proclivities, it's exactly what Kay would think. I mean, this is yet another instance in which... Uh, Kay always thinks that the, wor the world is a dog-eat-dog -dog world and uh, everybody's out to get him, you know, at uh, the moment of weakness. Yeah, I think it's an internalization of his guilt without coming to terms or accepting it yet where he's not even able to, like, anything good that happens in his life, he takes it with suspicion, you know? Like, he's just become a complete pessimist uh, because he's been put in a trial. Yeah, because, uh, I mean, it's not obvious that they're getting him out because, uh, you know, they hate him or they, they want to, like, you know, downgrade him or anything. Uh, like the last time that the, he was in the office, uh, it seems that the even the people at his work who are the least likely, uh, logically speaking, to give a fuck about him as a person, and uh, who would probably uh, want him out of the way if he's not uh, doing anything, uh, even they seem to just be aware that he's having a hard time and just to take the workload off his hands. But he takes this as an attack on himself, and they're like, oh, they think that I can't do it. Uh, and in fact, they're stealing my work from me. But then Kay acknowledges that he can't actually do it either. <laughs> and then he's he's an anxiety because he can't do it. And he doesn't want to do it. And he hates that he's like being pushed to the side for the moment. But that's exactly what he wants him to do anyways because he can't fucking do the job. So, you know, it's, uh, this seems to me just like uh, 
his uh, superiors uh, actually being nice to him and saying that well he can't handle the usual stuff let's just give him some easy stuff and get him out of the office because probably being in the office seems to depress him more than anything <laughs> Alright, uh, for this reason he never demurred from accepting them and even when he was asked to go on a tiring business trip lasting two days he said nothing about having to go out in the rainy autumn weather when he had a severe chill just in order to avoid the risk of not being asked to go. Oh, so that makes it seem also that it's somehow he considers this a double, a double bind. Uh, if he says yes you know they're, they're screwing him out of the job that he normally would should be doing. If he says no, they'll be you know they're gonna hold it against him because oh he's not up for it. Uh, understand that that's understandable from like Kay's perspective, but uh, no reason so far in the story to think that's true. Uh, when with a raging headache he arrived back from this trip, he learned that he had been chosen to accompany the Italian business contact the following day. The temptation for once to turn the job down was very great, especially as it had no direct connection with business. But there was no denying that social obligations towards his, this business contact were in themselves important enough, only not for Kay, who knew quite well that he needed some successes at work if he was to maintain his position there, and that if he failed in that, it would not help him even if this Italian somehow found him quite charming. He did not want to be removed from his workplace for even one day. As the fear of not being allowed back in was too great, he knew full well that the fear was exaggerated, but it still made him anxious. However, in this case, it was almost impossible to think of an acceptable excuse. His knowledge of Italian was not great, but still good enough. The deciding factor was that Kay had earlier known a little about art history, and this had become widely known around the bank in an extremely exaggerated form, and that Kay had been a member of the Society for the Preservation of City Monuments, albeit only for business reasons. It was said that this Italian was an art lover, so the choice of Kay to accompany him was a matter of course. It was a very rainy and stormy morning when Kay, in a foul temper at the thought of the day ahead of him, arrived early at 7 o'clock in the office so that he could at least do some work before his visitor could prevent, would prevent him. He had spent half the night studying a book of Italian grammar so that he would be somewhat prepared and was very tired. His desk was less attractive to him than the window where he had spent far too much time sitting of, of late, but he resisted the temptation and sat down to his work. Unfortunately, just then the servitor came in and reported that the director had sent him to see whether the chief clerk was already in his office. If he was, then would he please be so kind as to come to his reception room as the gentleman from Italy was already there. I'll come straight away, said Kay. He put a small dictionary in his pocket, took a guide to the city's tourist sites under his arm that he had compiled for strangers, and went through the deputy director's office into that of the director. He was glad he had come into the office so early and was able to be of service immediately. Nobody could seriously have expected nobody could seriously have expected that of him. That's weird. Uh, as far as I know in any business uh, they want you if they tell you they're uh, be there at five they really mean be there at four. <laughs> <laughs> See that he was glad. Had to empty as a success. I lost my place. Oh, okay, got it. The deputy director's office was, of course, still as empty as the middle of the night. The servitor had probably been asked to summon him too, but without success. As Kay entered the reception room, two men stood up from the deep armchairs where they had been sitting. The director gave him a friendly smile. He was clearly very glad that Kay was there. He immediately introduced him to the Italian who shook Kay's hand vigorously and joked that somebody was an early riser. Kay did not quite understand whom he had in mind. It was moreover an odd expression to use, and it took Kay a little while to guess its meaning. He replied with a few bland phrases, which the Italian received once more with a laugh, passing his hand nervously and repeatedly over his blue, gray, bushy mustache. This mustache was obviously perfumed. It was almost tempting to come close to it and sniff. How the hell would you know that? <laughs> like, how could you tell? 
I mean, you could tell that somebody has perfume on. How would you tell that their mustache is perfumed? <laughs> I don't know. It's, got, it's waft. He's wafting, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's an odd one. So, <clears throat> when they had all sat down and begun a light preliminary conversation, Kay was disconcerted to notice that he understood no more than fragments of what the Italian said. When he spoke very calmly, he understood almost everything, but that was very infrequent. Mostly the words gushed from his mouth, and he seemed to be enjoying himself so much his head shook. When he was talking in this way, his speech was usually wrapped up in some kind of dialect which seemed to Kay to have nothing to do with Italian, but which the director not only understood, but also spoke. Although Kay ought to have foreseen this, as the Italian came from the south of his country, where the director had also spent several years. Whatever the cause, Kay realized that the possibility of communicating with the Italian had been largely taken from him. Even his French was difficult to understand, and his mustache concealed the movements of his lips, which might have offered some help in understanding what he said. Kay began to anticipate many difficulties. He gave up trying to understand what the Italian said. With the director there, who could understand him so easily, it would have been pointless effort. And for the time being, did no more than scowl at the Italian as he relaxed sitting deep but comfortable in the armchair, as he frequently pulled at his short, sharply tailored jacket and at one time lifted his arms in the air and moved his hands freely to try and depict something that Kay could not grasp, even though he was leaning forward and did not let the hands out of his, out of his sight. Kay had nothing to occupy himself but mechanically watched the exchange between the two men and his tiredness finally made itself felt to his alarm. Although fortunately in good time, he once caught himself nearly getting up, turning around, and leaving. Eventually, the Italian looked at the clock and jumped up. After taking his leave from the director, he turned to Kay, pressing himself so close to him that Kay had to push his chair back just so that he could move. The director had no doubt seen the anxiety in Kay's eyes as he tried to cope with this dialect of Italian. He joined in with this conversation in a way that was so adroit and unobtrusive that he seemed to be adding no more than minor comments, whereas in fact he was swiftly and patiently breaking into what the Italian said so that Kay could understand. Kay learned this way that the Italian first had a few business matters to settle, that he unfortunately had only a little time at his disposal, and that he certainly did not intend to rush around to see every monument in the city, that he would much rather, at least as long as Kay would agree, it was entirely his decision, just see the cathedral and do so thoroughly. He was extremely pleased to be accompanied by someone who was so learned and so pleasant. By this, he meant Kay who was occupied not with listening to the Italian but the director, and asked if he would be so kind, if the time was suitable, to meet him in the cathedral in two hours' time about ten o'clock. He hoped he would certainly be able to be there at the time. Kay made an appropriate reply. The Italian shook first the director's hand and then Kay's, then the director's again, and went to the door, half turned to the two men, who followed him and continued to talk without a break. Kay remained together with the director for a short while, although the director looked especially unhappy today. He thought he needed to apologize to Kay for something and told him. They were standing intimately close together. He had thought at first he would accompany the Italian himself, but then he gave him no, no more precise reason than this. Then he decided it would be better to send Kay with him. He should not be surprised if he could not understand the Italian at first. He would be able to very soon, and even if he really could not understand very much, he said it was not so bad, as it was really not so important for the Italian to be understood. And anyway, Kay's knowledge of Italian was surprisingly good. The director was sure he would get by very well. And with that, it was time for Kay to go. Okay, I think it's just uh, some quick stuff to comment on. Uh, it's like this whole little, little discussion between the Italian and the director is uh, interesting. The perfumed mustache must mean something, and the mustache itself probably means something, but. Uh, doesn't come to mind. Although, I mean, it kind of has a functional thing that, like, you know, uh, Kay is apparently a lip reader of sorts. Uh, or at least he probably fancies himself to be a lip, a lip reader. I mean, he fancies himself to be a good at many things so far in the story, and uh, it's a terrible uh, overestimation of his skills. <laughs> He's just a sweet smelling Italian, you know? Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe the whole perfumed mustache thing is kind of like an overtone of like, you know, speaking sweet nothings. 
<laughs> who knows <laughs> you know mm. given that given that mm. Kate doesn't understand uh, most of what the Italian says it could just be like a way to emphasize that this is a fancy rich Italian guy mm. you know he's so fancy he's uh, perfuming his mustache mm, it's aromatic yeah suave guy probably So let's see, they have the talk. Uh, his speech was usually wrapped up in some kind of... The, so Kay can understand him when he talks slow. When he talks fast, uh, Kay can't understand. And, and Kay in, uh, assumes that it's a different dialect. Uh, which to me uh, may be the case, may not. Uh, it could just be that Kay way overestimates his Italian. Uh, which would be normal. I mean, most people, like when you're first... You're not... Uh, fully immersed in the language all the time uh, you can understand things slowly uh, but then like when somebody speaks at like the native level like it's very very difficult to to hold on like I can understand like for example this is weird I can understand my friend Pedro's Portuguese but if I like watch like a, a like or listen to anybody speaking Portuguese like normally like in, in the everyday sense uh, I can't understand shit <laughs> Uh, and that's because like Pedro usually like is uh, at least when he's doing like uh, I've only like listened to his, his stuff uh, he was doing like some kind of lecture series on music and uh, I listened to it and I could understand like probably 90% of it uh, yeah he's a professional enunciation yeah so there could be that K, K could be and likely is uh, overestimating his skill right so you know, then he 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 attributes this to uh, he must be speaking a different dialect. Uh, K realized that the possibility of communicating with the Italian had been largely taken from him. Even his French was difficult to understand, and his mustache concealed the movements of his lips, which might offer some help in understanding what he said. Uh, this is a very weird thing to think that uh, the possibility of communicating had been largely taken from him. You know, as if the director has taken taken his capacity to uh, communicate with this guy even though they're just having an everyday conversation uh, right. why one would, would interpret that is strange uh, the thing about lips uh, to me is symbolic of how Kay tries to get at most of everything so far in the book that he uh, instead, instead of just being out with it and, and like telling them, uh, I can't understand like half of what you're saying. Could you slow down a bit? To which mm -hmm. they probably would would have you know slowed down for him. Instead, he just decides to assume that this isn't necessary. And that he's going to find some like run around way to to indirectly get at it. Uh, so in this way, you know, he's trying to look at the lips. Uh, which, by the way, might also be an allusion to the prior chapter where Block talks about the superstitious nature of uh, the P the defendants in the court, uh, such that you know there's one superstition that you know from the lips of uh, another defendant uh, you could tell uh, whether they would be charged, uh, whether they would be convicted or not, and uh, mm -hmm. sometimes what, what they could tell that whether they or the person who's seeing the other's lips would themselves be convicted. So Kay's trying to look at the, his lips and uh, f uh, from that tell what kind of judgment is going on in, in the conversation. Maybe I'm overreading that, but just a thought. So let's see, K began to anticipate many difficulties. He gave up trying to understand what the Italian said. Was the director there who could understand him so easily, it would have been pointless effort, and for the time being did not did no more than scowl at the Italian as he relaxed sitting deep but comfortable in the armchair as he frequently pulled at his short, sharply tailored jacket and at one time lifted his arms in the air and moved his hands freely to try and depict something that K could not grasp, even though he was leaning forward and did not let the hands out of his sight. Uh, yet again, you know, he's trying to just find some third way to get at the meaning of the conversa conversation instead of just asking them directly. Uh, 
and he's given up uh, given up without even trying really without without trying the, the one thing that is the most obvious that, that would fix the whole situation is to, to ask him can you slow down uh, and yet again you know K assumes things you know he's like well the director's here he's talking to him he understands him so what would be the point of me understanding him uh, you know it would, it would be a pointless effort This is uh, something we've seen before, you know, in multiple instances where K just assumes things and says like, oh, well, in the end, it, you know, this thing initially is like, it's so important, then he can't do it. And he's like, oh, well, it didn't matter anyways. So K had nothing, uh, oh, the thing, he's scowling at them, uh, which would be something very noticeable. <laughs> He's not in a good mood. Uh, K had to occupy himself, uh, but mechanically. Well, oh, K had nothing to occupy himself, but mechanically watched the exchange between the two men. His tiredness finally made itself felt. To his alarm, although fortunately in good time, he once caught himself nearly getting up, turning around, and leaving. Yeah, that certainly s says that you totally want to be there. Eventually, Talon looked at the clock and jumped up. After taking his leave from the director, he turned to K. Pressing himself so close to him that K had to push his chair back just so that he could move. The director had no doubt seen the anxiety in K's eyes as he tried to cope with the dialogue to Italian. He joined in with this conversation in a way that was so adroit and unobtrusive that he seemed to be adding no more than minor comments, whereas in fact he was swiftly and patiently breaking into what the Italian said so that K could understand. So, you know, here's a the director noticed uh, his discomfort and uh, rightly judged what it was and uh, is helping him out. K learned his way, blah blah blah, business matters, at the cathedral. Uh, yeah, let's see. He was, let's see, the Italian says he was extremely pleased to be accompanied by someone who was so learned and so pleasant by this he met K, who was occupied not with listening to the Italian but the director and asked if he would be so kind if the time was suitable to meet him in the cathedral in two hours time at about 10 o'clock uh, so this is obviously just being polite to K's face I mean if he was scowling at them and he almost got up and left in the middle of their conversation uh, I'm sure the Italian is being ironic here because uh, he can tell that K doesn't want to be there that K is not a very uh, pleasant person <laughs> to be around And at least on Italian, K is not so learned. Uh, yet another example of people uh, putting in a good word, uh, painting a uh, deceitful portrait of K that makes him a lot better or seem a lot better than he actually is uh, in order to help him out. All right, uh, the whole thing. See, uh, the director tells K that he's uh, not to worry too much about uh, understanding the Italian. That uh, you know he'll get used to it uh, quickly enough. And if he doesn't, it doesn't matter because the Italian doesn't really care very much about being understood. So do do do, and that's where we left it. So he spent the time still remaining to him with a dictionary, copying out obscure words he would need to guide the Italian around the cathedral. It was an extremely irksome task. Servitors brought him the mail. Bank staff came in with various queries, and when they saw that Kay was busy, stood by the door and did not go away until he had listened to them. The deputy director did not miss the opportunity to disturb Kay, and came in frequently, took the dictionary from his hand, and flicked through its pages, clearly for no purpose. When the door to the anteroom opened, even clients would appear from the half-darkness and bow timidly to him. They wanted to attract his attention, but were not sure whether he had seen them. All this activity was circling around K with him at its center while he compiled the list of words he would need, then looked them up in the dictionary, then wrote them out, then practiced the pronunciation, and finally tried to learn them by heart. The good intentions he had earlier, though, seemed to have left him completely. 
It was the Italian who had caused him all this effort and sometimes he became so angry with him that he buried the dictionary under some papers, firmly intending to do no more preparation, but then he realized he could not, not walk up and down in the cathedral with the Italian without saying a word. So, with an even greater rage, he pulled the dictionary back out again. So, to me, this is a little mini trial. Uh, it's K putting a burden on himself that he's already been told, don't worry about it. And he's making it a problem for himself. Which one could say is this entire book. So at exactly half past nine, just when he was about to leave, there was a telephone call for him. Lenny, or as other people pronounce it, Lenny. I mean, I've, I've been saying Lenny this entire time, so I'll keep saying Lenny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel like Lenny is probably more accurate. Yeah, it's like Lenny Richtenstein. Like, Lenny is a dude's name. No, it's a bit. Yeah, oh, Lenny. Oh, Lenny. Lenny. Yeah. yeah, that's where I get my uh, fried seafood yeah. at Lenny and Joe's. <laughs> Shout out. I haven't had fried soup. It sounds disgusting, but probably tastes good. Oh, it tastes good. You know? Yeah, but yeah. anyways. We made the mistake for uh, eight chapters. We're committed to it. Yeah, we. <laughs> <laughs> you could have corrected me again, if you knew. Yeah, I did know, but I, I don't want to stop you and be like, actually, it's lady. Well, and also, I don't want to correct you because, like, if I do, then maybe you'll eventually be like, well, why don't you read Josh? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not reading. Lenny wished him good morning and asked how he was. Kay thanked her hurriedly and told her it was impossible for him to talk now as he had to go to the cathedral. To the cathedral? asked Lenny. Yes, to the cathedral. What do you have to go to the cathedral for? said Lenny. Kay tried to explain it to her briefly, but he had hardly begun when Lenny suddenly said, They're harassing you. One thing that Kay could not bear was pity that he had not wanted or expected. He took his leave of her with two words, but as he put the receiver back in its place, he said, half to himself and half to the girl on the other end of the line, who could no longer hear him. Yes, they're harassing me. Well, another translation, instead of harassing, it's uh, hounding. It's, uh, they're hounding him. Uh, now this is an odd chapter uh, in that uh, Uh, if you remember that he, uh, when he dismissed the lawyer, he said uh, he wanted contact with none of them ever again. No, not the lawyer, not Block, not Danny. But it also makes sense that, you know, Kay is uh, not that uh, strong-willed uh, in many ways. So that uh, Lainey would still uh, keep her clutches on him to some extent uh, and uh, keep tabs. is isn't surprising. As for uh, what it could mean that they're harassing him or hounding him, and how that has to do with the church, uh, we will see. By now the time was late and there was almost a danger he would not be on time. He took a taxi to the cathedral. At the last moment he had remembered the album that he had had no opportunity to give to the Italian earlier, and so took it with him now. He held it on his knees and drummed impatiently on it during the whole journey. The rain had eased off slightly, but it was still damp, chilly, and dark. It would be difficult to see anything in the cathedral, but standing about on cold flagstones might well make Kay's chill much worse. The square in front of the cathedral was quite empty. Kay remembered how even as a, small, uh, as a small child, he had noticed that nearly all the houses in this narrow square had their curtains at their windows closed most of the time. Although today, with the weather like this, it was more understandable. The cathedral also seemed quite empty, of course. No one would think of going there on a day like this. 
Kay heard along both the side knaves but saw no one but an old woman who, wrapped up in a warm shawl, was kneeling at a picture of the Virgin Mary and staring up at it. Then in the distance he saw a church official who limped away through a doorway in the wall. Kay had arrived on time. It had struck ten just as he was entering the building, but the Italian was not there. Kay went back to the main entrance, stood there indecisively for a while, and then walked around the cathedral in the rain in case the Italian was waiting at another entrance. He was nowhere to be found. Could the director have misunderstood what time they had agreed on? How could anyone understand someone like that properly anyway? Whatever had happened, Kay would have to wait for him for at least half an hour. As he was tired, he wanted to sit down. He went back inside the cathedral. He found something like a small carpet on one of the steps. He moved it with his foot to a nearby pew, wrapped himself up tighter in his coat, put the collar up and sat down. To pass the time, he opened the album and flipped to the pages a little, but soon had to give up as it became so dark that when he looked up, he could hardly make out anything in the side nave next to him. Alright, so the description of the area of the cathedral uh, is of some significance. It's not entirely clear to me what. Uh, the fact that it's a rainy day, it's a uh, case in a bad mood. Uh, his his uh, anxiety and uh, I would call it depression. Uh, you know, the fact that he's just he's he's stuck. He can't do anything. He doesn't have the the wherewithal, energy, or impetus, or even desire to do anything. Uh, you know, he's just obsessed with the trial, but he can't do anything about the trial either. Uh, so that so uh, that certainly signifies the state of mind and the state of his life. Uh, that uh, the houses or the buildings around the cathedral always have their windows covered up, you know, the drapes shut, is interesting. Uh, you got any idea what that might mean? Josh? Nope. Hyperion. <laughs> I mean, uh, maybe one of them is that the people whose life is, is like close to the church uh, kind of close themselves off from the world. I mean, may, may, I mean, that would have probably been a, a lot easier back in the day. Uh, nowadays, it's with the way of mass society it's nearly impossible I mean it's, it's the kind of way in which like sure you might if you live in like in a fundamentalist household or something uh, they might not allow you to watch whatever is like a fad nowadays like when I was a kid my parents didn't let me watch the Simpsons because they said stupid uh, in the show and they're like that's a bad well, word I'm like, oh. maybe he's commenting on I mean I I feel like it was still beginning to happen during this period, like especially after the 19th century. It exploded more so later in the 20th century, but, you know, secularization was becoming more of a norm. Like, religion was becoming uh, sidestepped as the most important part of uh, public society. So maybe it's saying something about that, like, that it's literally empty, uh, the neighborhood around it. It's not just that, uh, you know, the people there are stuck in their homes. It's that the homes are abandoned, even. That could be. That, that is a good interpretation, I think. Yeah. yeah. But again, it feels weird for me to say that because... You know, yes, things were getting more secular at that time period, but it feels like way more different than it is right now, where it's very, very secular. Whereas back then, uh, religion was still pretty, pretty fucking important in the public sphere. It wasn't the most important thing anymore, but it's still important. Yeah. Now, dip, uh, we'll, we'll get to what happens inside, but uh, I'll just hint... Uh, part of the nature obviously he's going to church 
the it's a cathedral. Uh, it to me you could also take this as symbolic, uh, and it would be a, a, a very good uh, geographical symbolization of the loneliness of the, the the spiritual life of well, and any being that is capable of uh, thought uh, and reflection and all these other things, self understanding. Uh, and you know, it's like uh, you, you'd think that you'd go into church and that you're gonna, uh, you find a community of everybody who understands everybody. Uh, but it's like the court where you know, uh, when Block uh, was talking to, to Kay about it, uh, Block told them that uh, uh, despite the fact of how much uh, it might seem that defendants know about each other, uh, there is no common cause and there is no real camaraderie between defendants. Uh, that everyone realizes in the end that their trial is their own that there there's nothing that anyone else can do to help them and so they don't really bother like uh, sharing much uh, about their trials with anybody not that they keep it to themselves entirely because block was ready to talk with anybody about it uh, but uh, they don't go out of the way to do so either uh, like they or at least with like other defendants uh, they, they realize that it's pointless uh, so, you know, the, the church itself uh, would be a lonely place uh, in that sense as well. That's a radically individual. And, uh, interesting thing, the cathedral is very dark. Uh, so it's a lonely rainy day. Uh, nobody's there except an old woman. Uh, there seems to be a church uh, worker. Uh, Otherwise, it's dark inside. Well, it's also striking in its loneliness because it's like a fucking cathedral, you know? It's so huge. And so, like, you know, they're designed to make you feel small compared to God. And uh, uh, yep, especially yeah. if you're alone in a cathedral, that is powerful. Yeah, I think that's uh, definitely uh, intended here. So let's see, he was tired, he found a carpet on the steps. He moved up with his foot to a nearby pew. I don't know why he... I mean, uh, I don't know the etiquette of times. Uh, at, so I don't know like, how normal it was to expect that you'd just be standing in a carpet and move it. But okay. Uh, to pass the time, he opened the album, flicked through the pages a little, but soon had to give up as it became so dark that when he looked up, he could hardly make out anything on, in the side nave next to him, which that's pretty fucking dark. In the distance, there was a large triangle of candles flickering on the main altar. Triangle. Kay was not certain whether he had seen them earlier. Perhaps, that, perhaps they had only just been lit. Church staff creep silently as part of their job you don't notice them when Kay happened to turn around he also saw a tall stout candle attached to a column not far behind him uh, that's an interesting one church staff creep silently as part of their job you don't notice them uh, sounds a li lot like a certain court when Kay happened to turn around he saw also saw a tall stout candle attached to a column not far behind him it was all very pretty but totally inadequate to illuminate the pictures which were usually left in the darkness of the side altars and seemed to make the darkness all the deeper. It was discourteous of the Italian not to come, but it, also, but it was also sensible of him. There would have been nothing to see. They would have had to content themselves with seeking out a few pictures with Kay's electric pocket torch and looking at them in one small part at a time. It's a fancy name for a, a flashlight. <laughs> well, don't... British people still call flashlights torches. Indeed. Hey. Did not know that. Still a fancy way to say flashlight. <laughs> yeah. Although shorter. Yeah. <laughs> eh, I don't know how fancy it is. It's pretty. Well, electric pocket torch. Yeah. So, Kay went over to a nearby side chat side chapel to see what they could have hoped for. He went up a few steps to a low marble railing and leant over it to look at the altar picture by the light of his torch. 
The eternal light hung disturbingly in front of it. The first thing that Kay partly saw and partly guessed at was a large knight in armor who was shown at the far edge of the painting. He was leaning on his sword on his sword that he had struck uh, that he had stuck into the naked ground in front of him where only a few blades of grass grew here and there. He seemed to be paying close attention to something that was being played out in front of him. It was astonishing to see how he stood there without go going any closer. Perhaps it was his job to stand guard. It was a long time since Kay had looked at any pictures that he studied the night for a long time, even though he had continually, he had continually to blink as he found it difficult to bear the green light of his torch. Even when he moved the light to the other parts of the picture, he found an internment of Christ shown in the usual way. It was also a comparatively new painting. He put his torch away and went back to his place. And so this night will become a bit more important later on. Um, that his torch was green. Hmm. That's kind of odd. I have no clue what green signifies in, like, German and that part of Europe. Like, I can think of the things it means in mm -hmm. English, you know, like, uh, being new, being fresh, uh, green being green. envious, yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't know, it, it means those things for Germans, too. I feel like the fresh meaning possibly but the envious meaning less sure of uh, another layer uh, which probably well seems to me like very easy to to see is uh, that it's not clear white light so it's a uh, it's a projected filter onto what K is seeing so he's not seeing it properly in like how it actually looks uh, as what it actually looks. So there's a, there's a bit of distortion uh, from his side. So it's, it's interesting that it's described as the eternal light. Okay, the I did look it up. I am seeing stuff about you know inexperienced, young, unripe. Those being meanings of Grun in German, but I don't know about envious. No. Um. Being green, like, you know, fresh, but also freshness in general. Growth. Health, purity. Yeah. Oh, the word green is related to grow. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that. I did not know that either. It makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it does. Uh, any ideas for what, uh, why... He says, he describes the light of his torch uh, as the eternal light uh, hung disturbingly in front of him. I mean, it could be, you know, light is often a symbol of knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. yes. that, that could be his uh, reaction towards uh, revelation or something like that. I mean, he did just see uh, an internment of Christ shown in the usual way. It was yeah. also a comparatively new painting. So let's see. Uh, so Kay went over nearby side chapel to see what they could have hoped for. He went up a few steps to a low marble railing and leant over it to look at the altar picture by the light of his torch. The eternal light hung disturbingly in front of it. The first thing that Kay partly saw and partly guessed at was a large knight in armor who was shown to shown at the far edge of the painting. 
So the eternal light hung disturbingly in front of him. So his torch uh, is in front of the painting, hangs disturbingly in front of it. Like disturbingly, that that would be to me. That's sort of a, a an implication that there's well, once once it's described, that's even green. That, that I mean, that's even more disturbing. Uh, the, the light itself is in the light itself, which is supposed to reveal this painting, is itself in the way of seeing this painting. It's disturbing it, uh, which is uh, interesting. Uh, if you take the pr if you take a, the Christian, which is I think this might be a Jewish thing, but uh, I doubt it because uh, it's more of a, a Christian uh, theme. Uh, you know the soul uh, as light, and you know, the uh, the eternal soul. So if you're somebody who is uh, spiritually disfigured, uh, your your light would not be clear. Uh, clear white light uh, so you'd have an off color something like green uh, and in revealing things you wouldn't reveal them exactly as what they really are they'd be tinged by your own projection onto it maybe I'm overthinking it but uh, just thought that was something interesting yeah that could be it I mean, I I would say that you shouldn't be hesitant to have any, like, Christian readings into any of this, even though Kafka was a Jew, because obviously, you know, he grew up around, you know, a Christian culture, and a lot of these ideas are floating in the sky. Like, uh, lots of the themes in this book in general strike me as having a bit of a Lutheran flavor, but... Wait, no. Hyperion, you would know this. Was Bohemia Catholic huh. or what? Most During this period? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Okay, the Reformation isn't really around there. In Prague. Or Prague. Uh... Yeah, the Reformation really hadn't taken hold in the Czech region. I mean, still hasn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's true. yeah. <laughs> we'll get rid of the Pope one day. So, anyways, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not hesitant just because like it's a Christian interpretation. Like, it doesn't matter that Kafka's a Jew, even if, even if he had intended to be Jewish. So. The symbolism still goes very well with Christianity, and so long as it holds uh, and is coherent uh, with the expression of all the themes in the work, it's good. Uh, so yeah, I think it makes sense that uh, we could interpret that uh, as K being the light which itself is revealing and at the same time disturbing uh, the side of the image. So there see, continuing, there seemed to be no point in waiting for the Italian any longer, but outside it was certainly raining heavily, and it was not so cold in the cathedral as Kay had expected. He decided to stay there for the time being. So uh, we don't know if it's raining heavily or not. Uh, I mean, uh, like cathedrals are big. I don't know if you'd, you'd probably have, like in my house, for example. I can't fucking hear when it's raining, which sucks. Because uh, I like the sound of rain. <laughs> uh, I thought you could probably hear rain from within a cathedral, which is much more massive. No. So uh, maybe he's assuming that. Uh, just another case of K assuming things. Uh, but anyways, he's staying in the cathedral. Closed by him was the great pulpit. There were two plain golden crosses attached to its little round roof, which were lying almost flat and whose tips crossed over each other. The outside of the pulpit's balustrade was covered in green foliage, which continued down to the column supporting it. Little angels could be seen among the leaves, some of them lively and some of them still. Kay walked up to the pulpit, examined it from all sides. Its stonework had been sculpted with great care. It seemed as if the foliage had trapped a deep darkness between and behind its leaves and held it there prisoner. Kay laid his hand in one of these gaps and cautiously felt the stone until then he had 
He had been totally unaware of this pulpit's existence. So, uh, the fact that he described this very detailedly, <laughs> to me, is a pretty good sign that uh, all this means something. Exactly what? I can't say. So, the outside of the pulpit's balustrade was covered in green foliage, which continued down to the column supporting it. Little angels could be seen among the leaves, some of them lively and some of them still. Kay walked up to the pulpit and examined it from all sides. Stone had been sculpted with great care. It seemed as if the foliage had trapped a deep darkness between and behind the leaves and held it their prisoner. Kay laid his hand on one of these gaps and cautiously felt the stone until then he had been totally ignored his pope's existence. Uh, him being unaware of the pulpit's existence in a pulpit is where, you know, the priest stands gives his sermons uh, and from which he can see the entirety of the lady uh, the laity uh, to me this is in indicative that uh, in the same way that Kay was unaware that the court existed was unaware that he had been on trial uh, that he was told uh, is unaware that there is somebody in the court somewhere that uh, knows everything that's up even though he doesn't know who and uh, I think it's pretty clear that it's not a human being <laughs> who, who would know uh, or at least not any normal human being uh, so that's a pretty good analogy I think the thing about the leaves in the darkness I'm gonna go out on a limb here uh, I, I think however it's a pretty good limb uh, good pun uh, <laughs> and uh, this is significant of nature well, why do you think I'm saying that uh Josh. Mm. It's it's on the outside. You know, it specifically mentions this. Ah, uh, yes. Because nature is the outsidedness of the idea. Yeah. You're off the twig now. It was covered in green foliage, uh, and it hides a deep dark darkness between and behind the leaves, which, I mean, that's also what nature is. Nature is a opaque uh, spirit. Mm -hmm. So, uh, interesting. Interesting that that, that little theme just uh, jumps out. Uh, now, I don't think Kafka... Like this is not a rare thing. Kafka seemed if he was aware of like esoteric stuff, he might he probably was aware of th themes like this, but not in the way that I'm understanding. Uh, I mean, I'm, this is a Hegelian uh, uh, notion of nature, which uh, does cohere well with standard spiritual notions of nature, but uh, you know has a further explicative element in which uh, nature is the. Is spirit outside of itself? It's the the external side, which appears uh, as what we call nature, physicality, temporality, spatiality, uh, and it's dark in that uh, it's not conscious, it's not aware, and it's not intelligent for itself. So it doesn't make itself easily known. So, yeah, yeah. Very good uh, expression symbolism. Uh, the spirit, the the angels, the little angels. Uh, what was it? Uh, little angels could be seen among the leaves. Some of them lively, and some of them still. Uh, that fact that angels would be present, uh, interweaved within nature, is just a common religious idea. Particularly, obviously, with uh, Abrahamic, Juda Judaic, and Islamic uh, view of the world. Also a holdover from paganism, but yeah, that too. Cultural inheritance. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, speaking uh, of angels, like the, the beings with wings and whatever, uh, Christians mm -hmm. didn't make that up. Nor did the Jews. Like that's way, way prior. <laughs> <laughs> the they're commonly seen, I guess, today as cherubs. You know, the little babies with angel wings. 
what they call them now, but you know, not to be confused with the cherubim and the biblical texts. Yeah, yeah, because the cherubim <laughs> and the biblical texts are fucking demonic-looking beings. Yeah. <laughs> the, the angels. If, you ever, if anyone listening is aware of the biblically accurate angels, that's, you know, usually they talk about the thrones and the seraphim and the cherubim as being the biblical accurate angels. It was a meme or a cultural item on the internet. Alright, so uh, let's move on from the pulpit. Kay was not aware. Then Kay, ha then Kay happened to notice one of the church staff standing behind the next row of pews. He wore a loose, creased black cassock. He held a snuff box on, in his left hand and he was watching Kay. Now what does he want, thought Kay. Do I seem suspicious to him? Does he want a tip? But when the man in the cassock saw that Kay had noticed him, he raised his right hand, a pinch of snuff still held between two fingers, and pointed in some vague direction. It was almost impossible to understand what this behavior meant. Kay waited a while longer, but the man in the cassock did not stop gesturing with his hand, and even augmented it by nodding his head. Now what does he want? asked Kay quietly. He did not dare call out here, call out loud here. But then he drew out his purse and pushed his way through the nearest pews to reach the man. He, however, immediately gestured to turn down his offer, shrugged his shoulders, and limped away. As a child, Kay had imitated riding on a horse with the same sort of movement as his limp. This old man is like a child, thought Kay. He doesn't have the sense for anything more than serving in a church. Look at the way he stops when I stop, and how he waits to see whether I'll continue. With a smile, Kay, f Kay followed the man all the way up the side nave and almost as far as the main altar. All this time, the old man continued to point at something, but Kay deliberately avoided looking around. He was only pointing in order to make it harder for Kay to follow him. Eventually, Kay did stop following. He did not want to worry the old man too much, and he also did not want to frighten him away completely in case the Italian turned up after all. Okay, that's highly symbolic as well. So an old man, ragged clothes, a cassock. So, see, uh, so he's watching Kay when the man with the cassock saw that Kay had noticed him. He raised his right hand. Oh yeah, he has a snuff box in his left hand. He raised his right hand, a pinch of snuff still held between two fingers and point it in some vague direction. Mm. Well, clearly that's meaningful, <laughs> but uh, give me a second to uh, clear up my impressions here. So, odd person, uh, though not the oddest person to be at church, qu uh, quite frankly. Given what a church is supposed <laughs> to be, anyways. Why is it um, odd? Uh, it's odd from the perspective of Kay. I mean, like, Kay, uh, it's not really odd, like, when I said, like, when you actually think about the purpose of a church is. I mean, you know, what is it like? Uh, or, or a cathedral. You know, like, you'd have homeless people who'd probably be at the front of, of a cathedral, most likely asking for alms. Uh, you'd have people who are disabled probably doing the same uh, so it's not mm. actually an oddity at all from the standpoint of the church oh I thought you meant the man in the cassock yeah or I mean, I'm misunderstanding he's a clergyman oh cassock a cassock uh, is you know it's like what catholic priests wear yeah the black thing ah uh, okay I was completely misunderstanding had a K moment there, I assumed that word. <laughs> <laughs> I admit my guilt on that. Okay. What, what were you assuming it meant? Like, he looked like a cassock, like... Did you think ca a Cossack? <laughs> yeah, a Cossack. That would have been amazing. <laughs> Sorry, no, never mind. No, nah, not a Cossack. I was thinking Cossack. It, sound, it sounds like something like it'd be like some kind of like raggedy... Oh. Yeah. But, uh, okay. Never mind. 
So no, nothing out here. Even the snuff, like snuff, was a normal thing back in these days. Yeah, before they found that it was bad for you. Uh, although I don't know why would a, a priest have a snuff? I mean, because because snuff was like considered a vice, like smoking. Even at this time, I think just people just do it casually. I don't know why would a Catholic priest do half the things they do. <laughs> Josh, I'm sorry if you're Catholic in the audience. We apologize. Yeah, uh, forgive us for our sins, uh, since humans can do it apparently, and not only God. Yeah. Um. <laughs> We have to think that snuff being tobacco you know, was not demonized as much as it is today. I mean, in the 20th century later. So yeah, it's not something that is usually attributed to being something a priest would use, but I don't think it was as... I don't, I don't think it was seen as that much of a vice, you know. Priests are always smoking in early iconography. Yeah, yeah, that's why I said like, it's probably that's probably not a place given the time. Yeah. So, so it's an old man, old priest. Mm -hmm. uh, he's following. He's being kind of we're just pointing there. Uh, Kay's being obstinate as he usually is. Uh, doesn't want to see what he's pointing out. He's because he's, he's focused on following the priest. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know. It's, I, I would take like two seconds to look at wherever he's pointing. So I'm not gonna lose that guy in two seconds. And if I do, well, he was pointing for a reason. Uh, and he's limping, uh, like the way that uh, a child pretends to ride a horse. You know, like, don't know if you guys did it. I know I did. You know, get on a broom, pretend it's a horse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. yeah. Typical thing. Yeah. Obviously, like this is a, a, a biblical reference itself. This old man is like a child. Um, it's the thing. Uh, Jesus says something along these lines. You know that uh, uh, you have to be childlike to get into heaven. Mm, debatable, but yeah, have a childlike uh, faith. So yeah, the, 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 it's not childlike as in. It's not. It's not simply as like, oh, well, you know, like a, a child which is ignorant. No, no, no. There's specifically yeah. something positive about being a child, uh, which an adult can have without reverting to a childlike mentality at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if that's in, in the Old Testament e as well. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah, it doesn't it's seem like it. Although this is. New Testament. Yeah. yeah although this is, this is actually, this is actually something not uncommon in esoteric uh, views of religion uh, mainly because of the circular uh, way in which uh, such Sorry, things tend out? to be you cut out the last 10 seconds or 5 to 10 uh, can you hear me yeah we can hear you but you cut out so say what you were saying again uh, I was going on uh, that th this view about like a uh, the unity of an, the end and the beginning, the old man as a child, uh, mm -hmm. is in esoteric, is in a lot of esoteric uh, religions. Though I can't say that it's necessarily always, uh, like it's not in the same re it's not in the same way as Christianity. When Christianity comes along, I, I think it adds a different layer to this meaning, uh, which was not there before. I mean, there's a, there's an obvious way, for example, in which like uh, the older you get, the more childlike you get in that. Uh, uh, and this is a common description as far as I'm aware that uh, once you get old, like really old, uh, you stop caring about the ways in which people perceive you anymore. I mean, you've kind of lived life, you know it, you've caught onto the game usually, uh, and you just are, you know, 
you become a lot more loose, free spirit like a child is. Uh, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Yep. Uh, very deep passage with a lot of misinterpretations <laughs> possible. But, but anyways, yeah, yeah, this theme about uh, getting old, being a child, the unity of that. Uh, not so rare. Uh, Christianity adds a different layer to it, but uh, I think that's enough to say about that. Uh, last thing on that little section, Kay's obviously judging him, and he's like, oh, he's just like a child, and I'm an adult. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, you know, I'm in bed with him in some way. Uh, just kind of a silly thing. I mean, the guy seems like he just kind of has a, a lame leg. Well, uh, Kay definitely would not like to hear what the next line is. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were dropped in the depth of the sea. Mm -hmm. So, a little <laughs> warning mean, to Kay there. So, it's so basically what's stated in chapter 3 when like the student just says, we should have just locked this guy in at home arrest because... He did. His freedom is just letting him fuck up even more. Yeah. He's, he's not getting better. But why is he not placed under house arrest or whatever arrest? Because the point is the trial. If you put him under house arrest, uh, the trial itself stops going because now he's not capable of acting. But in order for the trial to proceed, he has to be able to act and do things to see exactly what it is that. The judgment of his action itself uh, will bring about. So you yes, lock him in his room, he's, he's not going to grow as a person. He's just going to stall the trials to defer him. Well, like, if we were to do that, everyone would be locked in their rooms. <laughs> that, that wouldn't be worthwhile. Yeah. It's but like God says, okay, I'm doing the flood, but uh, Noah's not getting on that ark. Okay. I'm just flooding it all. That's basically what that would be. But our common thing is uh, usual. Freedom must be free. And requires the ability for one to make mistakes. Yep. Yep. And dig themselves deeper. Uh, by the way, I mean, like, uh, uh, as far as as far as mystical doctrine, now that I'm like, I'm not, I'm not like a great reader of esoteric texts. Uh, I mainly know we'll like, through through second hand for the most part. Uh, one of the things I found interesting, though, uh, from at least the two people who I've engaged probably the most directly, or actually three, uh, Swedenborg, Steiner, and uh, Casey. Case. All three are in agreement on this. Doing nothing is the worst thing you could possibly do with your life. They say, act and act decisively. It's better to do something and end up doing something great or even do something terrible. With, with any either a positive or a negative outcome, there's something that can be done about you. Your judgment and your trial can move on. But if you do nothing, nothing can be done to help you. And you, spiritually, you are stalled and your life is null uh, on that level. So inaction is the worst thing you could possibly do. Even if, even if you're Hitler, it's better to be Hitler than to be a neat. <laughs> Well, I mean, in that sense, K is, he could be worse. He could be worse. I mean, uh, he's acting. He's acting and fucking it up. <laughs> but he's doing <laughs> like something. Like all the time, but... Uh, like, the, the reason... When he, <laughs> yeah. when he tranced into 
court and you just like <laughs> it's fucking oh this court's illegitimate this trial's illegitimate uh you don't even have the right guy horrible mistake but better than nothing I guess. <laughs> Uh, yeah, because at least it, it gets a judgment. Judgments can be made and adjustments happen. Yeah. That's that's the main reason why. Because like, uh, in order for anything to happen, you gotta act. Uh, if you don't act, then nothing can happen. So you're left in a, a limbo, uh, and that's just not good. Mm-hmm. What about those meditating monks, though? Uh, well, Is that doing nothing? Uh, uh, that's doing that's doing something, something. okay although it, a lot of them end up doing nothing right i mean but yeah, it's a it, determinate nothing yeah it's a it, determinate it's not nothing. like a neat who have an indeterminate nothing yeah uh I mean, there's a joke about this. I think Alan Watts is the one who, uh, who says it. Uh, it's certainly Alan Watts, uh, where he says like uh, that people who are obsessed with like trying to get enlightened as quickly as possible and like, enlightened in the sense of you know, having spiritual experience and experiencing you know oneness of everything or whatever, uh, you know, enlightened like enlightened like the Buddha. Uh, he says people whose obsession in life is that and like they they make their life entirely about that are missing the point. Uh, because if, like you know, because they think that the point is like to get out of here, yeah? or like the Gnostics, right? That the Gnostics, uh, the main problem with the Gnostics is that they think that the point is to get out of this world. Yeah, uh, some Gnostics, a lot of them do, but not all. So if that's your view, then you're kind of in a contra- you're caught up in a contradiction, uh, and then you have to explain then if that's the point, then why does this entire world exist? Uh, but uh, that's a completely different thing. Uh, it's my we, uh, delusion. <laughs> yeah, we should move on. Yeah. Because, uh, uh, oh, God. There's already enough without going off on that tear. Yeah, because uh, we haven't even gotten to the meaty part of this, <laughs> this chapter. Yeah, we're going around Harvey's barn, as Joseph Farrell is. So, uh, so he's following the, the priest... The Italian hasn't turned up. Uh, When he entered the central nave to go back to where he had left the album, he noticed a small secondary pulpit on a column almost next to the stalls by the altar where the choir sat. It was very simple, made of plain white stone and so small that from a distance it looked like an empty niche where the statue of a saint ought to have been. So a smaller pulpit. Uh, it certainly would have been impossible for the priest to take a full step back from the balustrade, and although there was no decoration on it, the top of the pulpit curved in exceptionally low so that a man of average height would not be able to stand upright and would have remained would have to remain bent forward over the balustrade. In all, it looked as if it had been intended to make the priest suffer. It was impossible to understand why this pulpit would be needed as there was also the other ones available, which were largely and so artistically decorated. Yet again, the truly spiritual is uh, not made for physical comfort. It's, uh, at least materially speaking, quite uncomfortable. So NK would have certainly not have noticed this little pulpit if there had not been given a lamp. There, if there had not been a lamp fastened above it, which usually meant there was a sermon about to be given. So was a sermon to be given now, in this empty church? K looked down at the steps, which pressed close against the column, led up to the pulpit. They were so narrow they seemed to be there as decoration on the column rather than for anyone to use. But under the pulpit, K grinned in astonishment. There really was a priest standing with his hand on the handrail, ready to climb the steps and looking at Kay. Then he nodded very slightly so that Kay crossed himself and genuflected as he should have done earlier. With a little swing, the priest went up into the pulpit with short, fast steps. Was there really a sermon about to begin? Maybe the man in the cassock had not been really so demented, 
and had meant to lead Kay's way to the preacher, which in this empty church would have been very necessary. There was also somewhere in front of a picture, in front of a picture of the Virgin Mary, an old woman who should have come to hear the sermon. And if there was to be a sermon, why had it not been introduced on the organ? But the organ remained quiet and merely looked out weakly from the darkness of its great height. So yet again, Kay paying attention to the formalities we expect of things, uh, but instead of the content of things, uh, maybe there is going to be a sermon. And a sermon just for him. Kay now considered whether he should leave as quickly as possible. He did not do it now. There would be no chance of doing so during the sermon, and he would have to stay there for as long as it lasted. He had lost so much time when he should have been in his office. There had been, there had long been no need for him to wait for the Italian any longer. He looked at his watch. It was eleven. But could there really be a sermon given? Could K constitute the entire congreg congregation? How could he, when he was just a stranger who wanted to look at the church? That, basically, was all he was. The idea of a sermon now at 11 o'clock on a workday in hideous weather was nonsense. The priest, there was no doubt that he was a priest, a young man with a smooth, dark face, was clearly going up there just to put the lamp out after somebody had lit it by mistake. It is sad there's no organ playing with that. Don't need the organ of sound when the ultimate organ is about to play. <laughs> but there had been no mistake. The priest seemed rather to check that the lamp was lit and turned it a little higher. Then he slowly turned to face the front and leant down on the balustrade, gripping its angular rail with both hands. He stood there like that for a while and, without turning his head, looked round. Kay had moved back a long way and leant his elb elbows on the front pew. Somewhere in the church, he could not have said exactly where, he could make out the man in the cassock hunched under his bent back and at peace, as if his work were completed. In the cathedral, it was now very quiet. But Kay would have to disturb that silence. He had no intention of staying there. If it was the priest's duty to preach at a certain time, regardless of the circumstances, then he could. And he could do it without Kay's taking part, and Kay's presence would do nothing to augment the effect of it. So Kay began slowly to move, felt his way on tiptoe along the pew, arrived at the broad aisle, and went along it without being disturbed, except for the sound of his steps, however light, which rang out on the stone floor and resounded from the vaulting. The vaulting quiet, but continuous at a repeating, regular pace. Kay felt slightly abandoned as, probably observed by the priest, he walked by himself between the empty pews and the sides of the cathedral seemed to be just at the limit of what a man could bear. Then he arrived back at where he had been sitting. Uh, when he arrived back at where he had been sitting, he did not hesitate but simply reached out for the album he had left there and took it with him. He had nearly left the area covered by pews and was close to the empty space between himself and the exit when, for the first time, he heard the voice of the priest. A powerful and experienced voice, it pierced through the reaches of the cathedral, ready waiting for him. But the priest was not calling out to the congregation. His cry was quite unambiguous, and there was no escape from it. He called, Joseph K. So, uh, a lot of symbolism. Uh, I think the most symbolic thing is that we didn't already, or that isn't easily uh, interpretable, is uh, the priest is young and he has dark skin. Good to know that uh, Kafka was progressive long before it was the fashion. I'm sorry, what? I admit I didn't get to catch that. The priest is young and he has dark skin? Yeah. Mm hmm. Kafka was progressive long before it was the fashion? Oh. It's probably oh. not that dark. You, you, say, you think it was dark like Marx was dark? Yeah. 
I mean, they called Marx the Moor. You ever seen that one painting of Marx where he's like fucking like dark brown? Yeah. I mean, the man might as well have just come out of the islands of high tea. Well, I mean, at least he isn't. Ah, what's his name? The Social Democrat. What? You know who I'm talking about? The German Social Democrat that Marx hated. Uh, oh yeah, just, no, we're not going with that joke. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Anyways, uh, so I think the most important thing is is uh, dark skins probably not that rare. I mean, if Mark was Marx was uh, uh, rare, but not that rare, so not completely unexpected. Although probably symbolic in the sense that uh, you know you'd usually get that uh, the priest or you know light white skinned you know to symbolize holiness although darkness also uh, blackness also symbolizes uh, holiness in a different way uh, but I think this is more about uh, just an expectation uh, he's young I think that's the more uh, remarkable thing a young priest uh, and if he is, we remember that uh, K hates people uh, younger than him uh, you know, trying to teach him anything uh, he thinks it's a great shame to have somebody younger than you help you one anyway. Uh, so, you know, if this guy's going to preach to him, you know, I, I'd imagine that Kate probably feels ashamed. So, the priest is there for K. We are, what is it, 113. Okay, we're, we're like... about two-thirds of the way through the chapter so uh, probably best to uh, leave it here uh, so we can because because this then leads to the, the real meaty part so yeah we'll break it here and we'll continue next time uh, for those of you listening uh, hopefully you enjoyed it see you next time <laughs>